Welcome into the KSO Sunday Show. Mason Voth, KSU underscore fan here with you, as well as Drew Galloway. And not a not a great time for the Wildcats. Uh, I don't know who had the bigger blowout, K-State against Houston or my daughter this morning all over my shirt. <laughs> uh, it, either one, not very fun to uh, experience. And now K-State has to kind of find a way to Really bounce back this week. This is going to be a massive week for them. We'll have to, I guess, see how they respond come Tuesday night. But they've got to get a lot figured out uh, to make themselves uh, competitive and see kind of what comes about. So let's uh, let's just jump into it right now and take a look at uh, the results from this week. The 0-2 week for the Wildcats, they dropped by 11 to Iowa State, then 22 to Houston. Now, the Iowa State game, that score certainly not reflective of how close the game was. Uh, it it got out of hand with two minutes left because uh, David Gasson got called for a phantom foul, uh, and then there were free throws from that. Jerome Tang picked up a technical foul, which in the moment, like you're thinking, man, I get it. The officiating has been a, a thorn in your side all game, but – you can't get the you can't get the technical foul right there. Then we see the video of what happened in that moment. I go, I don't know that that's the time to hand out a technical foul for what went down there. Like if Jerry Pollard and his crew was going to give one out, there were certainly moments where I thought Jerome Tang might have been deserving during the course of the game. But for what he did, uh, and in the moment, it, it does end up looking bad uh, on on the officiating side of things. So. We'll just start with generic thoughts from the 0-2 week uh, because, look, I think Drew has said it a couple times. It's not like you expect to win both games this week, and really you're on the road against two of the top teams in the league. You shouldn't ex- you shouldn't be expecting to come out of wins with that. But it feels like in the way it all went down and the fact then that you were non-competitive against Houston, uh, overall it's just kind of a, a big kick to your ego. So, uh, Drew, what is the takeaway from K-State's semi-disastrous week i i think that it sucks more so in like how it happened like you, you were a lot closer than the score feels against iowa state and you honestly probably feel like you could have and maybe should have won that game but just allowed a big run at the end of the game and didn't make plays down the stretch the the one thing that really kind of hurts from the week i think is how the houston game went down Houston, I saw today, though, is their score differential in league play is plus 96. Second is KU at, like, plus 28. It's like Houston has been blowing people out, especially at home. But you would have liked to see a little bit more fight. The The thing that is just concerning to me, I think, going forward, is I think that we are probably at the point where anything that you get from Tyler Perry is great but I don't think that he's somebody that you can really rely on right now. Yeah. I, um, I, I listened to your show yesterday and you said maybe I'd be a little more reasonable. And I, I think I am going to be, um, I don't, the gut punch for the week to me is I said last week, I hoped one of the games, one of the two games would be a, a two possession game with under four timeout. Cause that's when you're on the road, you got to hope that's your hope as you get in a game where, you were in position to win the game at the under four. They did that at Iowa State. Of course, they didn't make enough plays. They, I mean, they didn't make enough plays. Or free throws. Early in the game, they missed some free throws. They didn't get to the free throw line enough. Um, I, I I rarely will go after officials. I, I would kind of in that one, but, you know, Hilton Coliseum, that's probably going to happen. So that, that one, I do agree with Drew. It was a missed opportunity. Um, the Houston game sucked. Like, it's – I thought we'd – I thought we'd get beat. I picked us to lose by, I think, 9 or 10. I didn't think it'd get to 30. But they did the same thing to the team that's leading the league right now at their place. Texas Tech got destroyed just as bad, if not worse, um, in that place. So um, that one you just chalk up. You know, coaches talk about, I think Tang's even mentioned, you have, you know, five games a year where you're going to play so well, no one's going to beat you. You're going to have five games a year where you're going to play so bad or your opponent's going to play so well, you have no chance. I think this game was kind of a combination of our, us playing that badly and Houston playing that well. Like mm-hmm. their defense was legitimately as good as as we are going to see. The other thing with this Meach week is is it was our toughest 
two game stretch we're going to have this season in league play or outside of league play. It's the toughest league stretch I think about any team would have in this league based on, especially when you consider the matchups, we talked about the deep, the turnovers and the rebounding, both being badly out of our favor going into both these games. And, and it showed up, you know, we were almost able to overcome it, overcome it against Iowa state, but the, the one advantage uh, that we've been pretty good at this year is getting to the free throw line and making twos. And Houston was a disaster in that area, which is magnified why it was worse than it was. Iowa State turned in a disaster in that area, especially at the free throw line. When you get outscored uh, by 12 or whatever it was at the free throw line and you lose by 11, uh, that's a pretty telling number uh, considering the rest. So um, the, that's the concern. I do think kids have short minds. The other factor with this week is we played Wednesday, Saturday. Yeah. In, in your tough week, when you have the, 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 instead of the Monday, Saturday or Tuesday, Saturday swing, you have the Wednesday, Saturday swing when, especially when Wednesday was a, a rock fight, dog fight, physical, get beat up. And then you go play an opponent that's better or just as good at doing that to you. That magnifies it. I think that all kind of came to a head in that game. So, um, I hated losing like that. That was not fun to watch, but I think it is one that if this team has any mental fortitude, you're going to wash, you're going to move on. I mean, last year, I think we get to comparing last year, we started what six, seven, one in the league, but then we had a stretch where we lost five out of six. Mm -hmm. So last year's team didn't have had its own bad stretches of games. And and that's what you hope to avoid with this year's team. I think the schedule lays out more favorably that you can avoid losing five out of six if this team's any good at all yeah last year they they were six and one and then they uh, had the close loss in hilton a game that they should have probably won uh and then they they came back beat florida uh and then they had two losses the ku in texas the win against tcu and then back-to-back road losses uh which kind of similar deal in terms of turnaround time uh because that was a saturday to a tuesday and you know k-state goes from a Wednesday to a, a Saturday here. And we know, I mean, K-State, they stayed on the road the entire time. So, yeah. you know, from Tuesday all the way through Saturday, they're away from home. Uh, th- their travel was affected by weather in Ames on the way out. So they were actually going to leave Wednesday night. They didn't end up leaving until Thursday morning. So there are a lot of things that, that were at play there and just two really tough opponents to play in the same week. Even if you know, even if you take away the style that those two teams play, but you still say, "Hey, those are these are two really good teams." These, you, I mean, arguably, those are these are the two best teams in the Big Twelve right now that K State played. I mean, I was very impressed by what I saw from Iowa State on Wednesday night. I watched them, and I early on you think, "How does anybody ever score on this defense?" And then you start to go, "Man, they're really good at getting looks for these guys wherever it is." Like they they are they are well put together. Uh, I also, I mean. Momchilovich, if he didn't play for Iowa State, that is a Mason Voth dude if I've ever seen it. Like, I I love that guy's game. I hate looking at him wearing red and gold or whatever the heck they want to call their colors. Uh, so it's just tough. And then you throw on top of it that they are physical teams, uh, both on the road. It's it's just tough to, to do that. And it'll be interesting to see how many teams are able – to really go out and survive weeks where they end up with two games on the road. We've talked about this with K-State. That's why early on they were doing so well uh, and why they were at the top of the Big 12 before Wednesday night's game. It's because they had a two-week, they had a one-week stretch where they played two games on the road. They split them, and then they were taking care of their business at home, kind of treading water on the road, and that's how you get a winning recipe. Why is Kansas 4-3 and three right now and off to their worst start in Big 12 play under Bill Self? It's because they've lost three road games, and two of them are games that you absolutely cannot lose. Like they should, there's no excuse for them to lose to West Virginia and UCF. Um, you know, and some people are going to talk about Iowa State. Look, Iowa State shot the lights out yesterday uh, at kind of a, mm-hmm. an unreal level, and KU still almost got the job done there. Um, so we'll we'll see how it all ends up playing out. I'm I'm not writing Kansas off yet, and everybody that has read the site knows uh, my thoughts on KU that until they don't do it consistently, they're always going to be my number one in the league. So this was just a tough week for K-State. I think morale-wise, it's tough. And I also start to wonder about what we've seen from some of the players and now some of the coaches in terms of how do they handle 
this kind of stress and problems going on? Because, Fan, you talked about last year and they they lose five of six in Big 12 play, I think it was. Um, one thing that never happened last season, though, was them losing three games in a row. Jerome Tang has never lost three games in a row. And it could happen on Tuesday night. I have a question for both of you, and this is probably more of a a theory, and then you guys can assess how you feel about it. But I'm starting to wonder if we're seeing some frustration kind of peek through for this staff. Because obviously Wednesday night, they were very emotional, and you can make the case that they handled it in a poor way against Iowa State, and we'll get into the Iowa State stuff in a little bit. But under eight timeout, it's a close game, and they're spending more time freaking out, yelling at TJ Otzelberger and refs. Here's the deal. I understand being frustrated if you think something nefarious is going on, but once the referees tell you that they're not doing anything about it, you have to move on in that moment. You have to move on and focus about your team. Quit being so animated and move on. It's easier said than done, but we all have had things go on in our life where you can be, your mind's this spot right here, tunnel vision, you're freaking out, but you got to lock in because that's not ultimately important. And then we obviously see Jerome Tang. He got a technical on, on Wednesday. He gets teed up in the game against Houston. And look, we, we don't know the actual exchange that happened between him and Gary Maxwell. Uh, there is some merit to, to his side if what he said Maxwell did and said was true. But at the end of the day, he gets teed up. He goes into a press conference and he calls a ref out by name. After Wednesday night, when I asked him about officiating, he just said, yeah, th these guys have a really tough job, all this stuff. Like, he was not in that mode. Like, we're seeing some different characteristics play out here. And I think it's because they are frustrated with the lack of success they're having and really the cards that they've been dealt this year, where you lose two guys that you thought were going to be key contributors, and now you're playing with a team that doesn't have depth and also just has guys that cannot get to the certain level that you want and expect from your program. I think there's frustration for them in the fact that you've hit your ceiling and you can't be better than what you are right now. And I think they're realizing that what they are right now is not good enough to be competitive in this league for 18 games and is going to put them, as of right now, on the wrong side of the NCAA tournament bubble. So, I'll open it up to your guys' thoughts on uh, that theory there and what we've seen from the K-State coaching staff this week because we've dis we've dissected the players a ton. Uh, but this week, I think it's a lot more about the K-State coaches and how things are getting handled. Yeah, I'd agree that there's definitely frustration coming through um, and, you know, any of these things in kind of isolation maybe wouldn't be a big deal, but it's kind of the culmination, like you said, of – of three to four different events coming together during this week. Um, you hope they can, you know, kind of refocus getting back home and, and get things figured out because they have to. I mean, they, they can't let these kind of things be things that carry over and distract from what they're trying to do is win basketball games. And I think they can, but clearly um, I do think the other factors that have happened this season um, with Tomlin and Glover, injuries and suspensions and kicked off the team that doesn't help things it probably magnifies it a little bit in their eyes but uh, at some point you got to move on and uh, not let things you can't control be things that you become consumed with and I think that happened a little bit this week and hopefully um, they can figure that out and move on this weekend and get ready for Tuesday night yeah I, I think they were seeing a little bit of frustration peek through but I also like at some point, you were probably just frustrated because just at the free throw line and the two games that K-State played this week, the, the opponents shot 73 free throws and K-State attempted 35. Yeah. So, so I think that you're getting some frustration because of that, because K-State has been so good at getting to the free throw line and avoiding fouls for the most part, that you think that these two games, like, what's going on? Like, how is it 73 to 35 in free throw attempts? And you add in that Jerry Pollard historically has not really been kind to K-State. And Gary Maxwell last year kicked two K-State students out of a game that you kind of wonder if this was just kind of a, a frustration of 
who was officiating the game too. But like the frustration I think is pretty warranted because if they weren't frustrated with how these two games went, I think I'd be more concerned. Yeah. I mean, I, maybe, uh, maybe we need to get John Higgins back with a whistle, you know, <laughs> calm the waters and officiating throughout the big 12, uh, get him back on the floor. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that there is a historical element there uh, with some of these guys, I mean, the Gary Maxwell thing last season made zero sense. Uh, and that was the Texas game, which, you know, was, was odd. Uh, I think, I think the officiating had a significant impact in the game against Iowa state. I look, Iowa state's clearly the better team. They were, they were better than K state. And I, I said this after the game, what makes Iowa state so scary is that they just have more guys that any given night can go out there and carry the load where we know for K state, they, this team only has three guys that can score at a level that helps you win basketball games. And you look at Iowa State, I mean, they ended up, obviously, Momchilovich had a great game against K-State. Uh, Gilbert was in double figures, and then uh, Jones was in double figures as well. Well, that doesn't factor in Taman Lipsy was coming back from an injury and wasn't anything special against K-State. And then Trey King fouled out played 16 minutes against K-State, and then against KU, he's just knocking everything down. It just goes to show that what K-State is missing relative to the rest of this league right now, and, and to some extent on a lesser level because they have more talent overall, but it's why KU is struggling so hard right now is that they don't have as many guys as they're accustomed to, or the guys on the higher end just aren't what they are used to either. Uh, and I, I think that w what we've seen is that this staff just they're having to try and find a way, do anything they can. And I think this is a good reminder of just how good the coaching staff is and has been at K-State. The fact that this team, the way they're constructed, who they have, how they play, the fact that they are still above 500 in league play and that they're now 14 and six overall. Um, and are going to fight till the very end to be an NCAA tournament team, that is a credit to this coaching staff because I'm not sure many other people would be able to do that because in line with everything else that's gone on, this staff also had to make Cam Carter such a better player to even be in this position. And I don't know how many other coaching staffs could have gotten Cam Carter to be the type of player he is this year. Now, the only thing that a coaching staff can't really fix, this is on the player, is turnovers. So – he and Arthur Kaluma need to get a little bit more smart about how they uh, they handle the basketball. But other than that, like you're not going to fault those guys. And sometimes the turnovers can just be a product of knowing you have to make more plays uh, and being forced into a really tough spot. So I just I thought about it yesterday and everything that's gone on this week, where very little of the focus after games or what people cared about was actually about the basketball that was played. Um, it's just about how everything was handled, which takes us into this. We've got the uh, Spiowa State situation going on, and look, this is this is a, a, a thing that we don't have a lot of good understanding of because Jerome Tang and T.J. Otzelberger, after the game, did not want to talk about it whatsoever. T.J. Otzelberger decided, though, he did want to talk about it after beating KU yesterday, which seemed kind of odd. And all this other stuff goes down. It's clear that, you know, Iowa State has has given their piece to uh, the national reporters and CBS uh, with Seth Davis yesterday, whereas Jerome Tang still has not said anything about it and uh, has, you know, seemingly kept his word about, you know, just keeping it between them and, and discussing it there. What do we make of this whole situation that has played out with obviously the under eight timeout is where we start to notice it. Up where we were, Drew, we were trying to figure out what was going on, and and I thought that it had something to do with a fan in terms of, like, he had been behind the bench and they were trying to get him to move out of the way. Like, he was, you know, looking around or grabbing, like, doing just stuff to be bothersome. I had no idea that it was going to get to this point where they were going to, you know, uh, assume that Iowa State had people planted places uh, and trying to get info from the huddle. So. With everything that we've kind of pieced together from different reports and different things that have been said, uh, what are your guys' thoughts on this whole situation? Um, 
it's it's first of all, I I hope it gets resolved soon and we can move on. It probably will just kind of <clears throat> go away. I think I thought the Iowa State response was more probably in response to the the article that came out from Kellis Robinette this week that kind of put some credence to the whole thing. It seemed like Tang, even though he was was animated during the game and after the game, you know, was just made it about him and TJ and they were going to talk about it and get it figured out. And I think probably that's where he would have preferred it stay. Uh, but the way that went down in the, in the video, it was going to probably get pushed by somebody in the media. And I think obviously that's what happened. Um, look, I've just even been around coaching for 20 years at the high school level, coaches are masters of being paranoid. And to me, this seems like a case where, for whatever reason, we got paranoid about something um, that we saw behind the bench or somewhere in the stadium. Maybe it was uh, – we just played Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma State supposedly had the same thing happen, and maybe the staffs talked about it after the game. I don't know. It seems like something like that could have happened. Um, but But to me, it seems like coaching paranoia – amped up to a hundred degrees because it's a heated battle. Um, and we just come back and we tied the game and kept tying the game and not taking the lead. And then something like this kind of gets blown up because someone points it out to Tang on the sideline and then it becomes a deal. So that's kind of the way I look at it. I think in the end of the day, it's not that big a deal. It's it's not Michigan Connor Stanion's level by any means, I don't think. And I think the sooner, again, just like the ref stuff, the sooner we can move on and get calibrated into focusing on our team and winning our basketball games and not stuff you can't control, the better you're going to be. Because that, that there's not – I don't think Iowa State got stops because they had some secret code of what we were going to do. It, it is kind of funny, though, that, like, from the K-State side, it kind of stopped, like – Nobody really cared until Otz brought it up again. Yeah. In his opening statement. Like, I thought that that was kind of weird to you just beat KU in a pretty emotional game. <laughs> and the first thing that you say is about something that Jerome Tang never publicly said. Yeah. So I don't know. It For me, it just makes the return game a lot more spicy and interesting. Because I'm interested to see how the game goes in pregame and postgame with, with the two sides. Because I don't think there's a lot of love there. Uh, the other thing that I'll add to the Spygate, whatever. Uh, Fran Fraschilla's retweet of uh, the <laughs> K-State fan uh, saying that he respects uh, Bill Self at his worst a lot more than Ots was still one of the stranger <laughs> things that I think has happened. And how that stayed up for so long. And then he like corrected it to something that made no sense with like the context of the tweet. Hmm. Yeah, he uh, yeah, you know, Fran did try to go in there and and correct himself. Uh, look, I I think that I think that Otzelberger probably should have not touched it uh, after the win against KU yesterday because if you and Tang had both talked and decided. Hey, we're not going to talk about it on Wednesday night. Well, doing it when it's a totally different day and it's a different set of people and they're like the KU people don't give a rat's ass about what happened in, in Wednesday's game. They're like, yeah, we're happy if Iowa State or K-State gets screwed. Like it doesn't matter which one it is to us. Like they don't care. Like I, I, I'm still of the opinion that that both guys should have stepped up and and said it. You don't have to go into great detail. But they should have been a little bit more upfront with what happened. You can't have two very public things go on in that game and then be like, it's all good. We, we talked about it. It's going to stay between us. We all saw it with our eyes. 10,000 people in there saw it with their eyes. Like, this is a public job that you do. And you are in a an industry that everything is very public. Like, when you do it in front of 10,000 people, in some way, you need to answer a little bit better than it's going to stay between us, especially when it somehow got out from the K-State camp 
And then the Iowa State camp shared their stuff as well after the game. And then Iowa State actually addressed it themselves with not only T.J. Otzelberger, but Seth Davis it says that Jamie Pollard talked to him yeah. about it, which I will give some uh, some credence to this. I thought it was hilarious because uh, I, I, I watched the full Seth Davis video today uh, where you know he, he demands an apology from Jerome Tang uh, despite not hearing the K-State side of things. Uh, that Jamie Pollard said for whatever reason in there that, well, actually, the Wi-Fi is terrible inside of Hilton Coliseum. So, <laughs> like, how would that even work? Like, it's it's pretty easy. You don't have to actually be recording video to use your phone. Like, the, the, my, the whole time, I don't think Iowa State was recording anything. I think they may have had, if they were, if they were doing it, they would have had their phones out to kind of zoom in and see better. Uh, it's just... I think this is one of those things, like Fan said, you know, the paranoia thing is real for these coaches. Um, that's why, I mean, I the K-State coaches have to be dang sure that this thing happened to be that bothered by it in the game to where, like, there's no question that it had to have affected the way they did their jobs in the game against Iowa State. Like, yes, the players could have come through and they did things that directly led to Iowa State winning that game. And, you know, the, the some of the fouls, that also helped mm-hmm in a way for Iowa state, but you can't be that focused and that animated about one thing and tell me that you're still doing your primary job up to the level that you need to. And that's something that concerns me a little bit moving forward, because as we've just discussed, things are not going to get easier for this K state team this season. They have a, they have an uphill battle to try and get into the NCAA tournament, which is the goal. And you have to be on top of it, not just your players, but your coaches. And, uh, I, you know, it, it, I think that that's the thing that stands out to me is that it's just a bad look for Jerome Tang and his staff, you know, a guy that has done everything right since he got to K-State and has built up this very public and national following because of how awesome of a guy and a coach he is that I just don't think it's, it's good to have all that spoiled a little bit because of this one incident. Uh, and so I'll, I'll be fascinated to hear how Jerome Tang addresses it uh, on, on Monday because he'll have a press conference again. Somebody's going to ask him about it, I'm mm-hmm. sure. And now that Iowa State has opened up the can of worms of discussing it publicly, um, I think he has to do it as well. Because, look, just as much as T.J. Otzelberger is offended by it, then Jerome Tang and his staff should equally be offended by Iowa State coming out and – saying, oh, well, like, this is just horrible to us. Like, we would never do such a thing. Well, then if you are if you feel good about it, then you should be able to come out and say the same thing, that, you know, their dismissal is 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 bad on, is bad to us. So uh, uh, I don't know what to make of this whole situation until we get more thoughts from Jerome Tang and, and here on that side. But it's, it's a mess right now, and it's just a totally unavoidable thing uh, that's going to really mess with your season right now. I'll also add in that, like we talked about the coaching paranoia with Tang. I, I think you're seeing a little paranoia with Jamie Pollard and mm-hmm. TJ Offelberger to immediately dismiss it with K State ever, without K State ever publicly saying yeah. something. Yeah. And, and that, that part is a little suspicious for me that they are so quick to deny anything that happened. Yeah. They, they, because they were responding to, because Kellis had the article and then I think there was a national guy that talked about it. And so, yeah, Pollard kind of, I mean, he brought it up earlier in the day around noon, I think, with the Seth Davis show. And and I think they even said at the time that Otz was going to talk about it at the beginning of the press conference. That was before the game had even been played. So Iowa State, for some reason, thought they needed to have a statement, even though there was, there's been no formal K-State in the public complaint. Mm-hmm. This was all based on sources from media members. So. Um, Tang never, you know, Tang said we talked about it, and then he gave TJ Osberger a big compliment in the yeah. in the post game of the game, actual game. So, like, and and then I think Tang did comment to maybe someone from the athletic yesterday after our game, and just said, "I said what I said in the press conference, mm-hmm. and what he said in the press conference was nothing happened. We talked with TJ, and TJ's a great guy." So. That's been K State's only official statement from Jerome Tang. So he has nothing to apologize unless they don't want him to be, uh, be nice to TJ Otzenberger. So, and also Iowa State would definitely know if K State had made an official statement on it because 
if there's one thing we've learned this basketball season, K-State Athletics and the administration of school <laughs> love to make public statements about very uh, public and polarizing subjects. So uh, they would have known. Uh, I'm sure somebody, maybe the president, athletic director, and head coach would have all done something. That's just a, you know, a theory that I have in my head that that is how something could play out. So it, it just makes you feel, it just makes you look guilty if you have to make a statement like dismissing a claim that was never officially made. Yeah. yeah I, I think, I, I think both sides come out of this looking <laughs> pretty poor uh, because look, I mean, it, I know KSO has a ton of body language experts. We learned that during the Skylar Thompson era. Uh, so I'll join in. TJ Otzelberger's reaction to after the game when Jerome Tang is likely explaining to him what they thought was going on, it wasn't like a, no, that we want to do something like that. It was kind of like an, oh, really? Where at? Like all this other stuff. Like it was a very, I don't know. It, maybe he was just so stunned that they were were asking about it, but um, I, I, don't, I don't think either side comes out of this looking good because – uh, the Iowa State response has been weird, and just to bring it up after a game where you lose and have all this stuff go on, it's not a good look for K State, and it's lingered on, and now they got to flush it and move on. Which brings us to this week: the Wildcats in a must-win situation, not just once but twice. I think you got to get both of these if you're K State. Oklahoma comes to Bramlage on Tuesday. Oklahoma State on the road on Saturday. Both teams kind of different weeks. Oklahoma also in desperation mode. They just lost two home games this week. Uh, blowout fashion to a Texas team that then, you know, maybe they were saving their season. They lose by double digits to BYU. And then Oklahoma State, they battle back and they get their first conference win of the season against West Virginia. What's the, the thought process going into this week for K-State? I mean, we talked about it. You, this is – a part of the schedule where you've got to make a move and win games. And, you know, I'd, I'd put, I'd package together the next three with, with KU on Monday. Uh, Drew, I think you mentioned you got to win two of the three, at least. I think that's accurate. Um, and I think of the three, I think, you know, probably your best chance is Tuesday night against Oklahoma. I mean, yes, Oklahoma is going to respond because they've been scuffling, but they've also been scuffling for a reason. This is a team we talked about, are they for real? Um, you look at where they – the other thing about this game is it's actually – we've we switched it. This is a good matchup for K-State. Oklahoma does not force turnovers. Oklahoma is not a great rebounding team. Oklahoma right now in Big 12 play is not a great shooting team. They're the eighth-best offense and the eighth-best defense in the league. Um, and their, their defense is last in the league at forcing turnovers. So K-State has an opportunity because they're playing a team that's – that's not super great right now and and coming off two home losses back to back and then you hope k-state has a great crowd because because i think that can affect them um they've got a really probably the least continuous team in the league they've got three guys that are second year players and mixed in with a bunch of transfers and freshmen and i think you know i give porter Mosier a bunch of credit for what they did in the non-conference and got a few decent wins uh but i think who they are and what they are about is truly coming to, to rest. And I think that's kind of the thing. The other thing with this era is it's taking teams a while to become who they are. And it's also taking teams a while when you're scouting to see who the team you're playing is. And I think people have kind of figured out Oklahoma at this point because um, most, most of their players in their last five games are, on a downwards trend with their scoring, with their efficiency, with their shooting. Uh, and I don't think that's by accident. I think that's, you know, cause they, they, you know, they didn't really bring in any studs. They, you know, uh, the, the McCollum kid is a, is a pretty good transfer. The returners, Uzon and Uwe are basically like their cam carters, like two guys that really made a big jump in their second year in the program. Um, but other than that, you know, they just have some nice players. And I think this is a game – I think this is absolutely almost what you would call a must-win game because you got to beat what I think is going to probably end up being a lower half of the league Big 12 team at home. you got to win those games, and this is one K-State's got to get. Yeah, I mean, the you talked 
and had it as like a gut punch with K-State losing two games. How Oklahoma lost with their games, that that is a true gut punch. Yeah. To lose both games at home against pretty winnable in pretty winnable games. And then you go to K-State, then they go to UCF on Saturday. And like you you look at OU schedule and you think, God, they could be on a four game losing streak by the end of next week. Yeah. But yeah, both both games K State has to have. And I mean, we we didn't really talk about Oklahoma State the first time that they played Oklahoma State, but like that. That that is a game that if you're going to steal a game on the road, they have the worst home record in the Big Twelve it's, right now. It's not it, it's not stealing a win against Oklahoma State. It's just a win you have to have. That Oklahoma State and, and West Virginia, they do not go in the category of oh, you stole a road win from somebody. Those are bad teams. You must beat them. And that so I'm not I I, I, I get what you're saying, and I'm not trying to, you know, put yeah. you in the corner here. I just I, I want to inject here that there's no reason K-State should lose to Oklahoma State on no. the road. I know teams have done it. I know teams have struggled there. You have to win that game if you want to be an NCAA tournament team because, as we've seen, you aren't going to steal road wins elsewhere. That's that's what we learned this these last three road trips for K-State. They aren't going to steal road wins from good teams, uh, at least not the way they're playing right now, and they haven't changed how they're playing. So that they have to they have to win both of these. The, the other thing, too, is like you, you win the Oklahoma State game, too. Your margin of error at home, again, gets a little bit bigger because if you want to get to 9-9, nine and nine, which will probably get you in the in the NCAA tournament, you you can afford to lose two games at home. So just having that, I think, would be big. But, yeah, the, this is a stretch where you need to win two of the three. You could easily win all three, I think. Yeah, I mean, you you definitely could. It helps that in this stretch, I mean, you can you can snag a whole bunch of momentum back if you are able to to beat KU next Monday. In addition to these two games, it helps that that's a home game uh, that you're getting the first crack at them at home uh, to kind of carry. Because even if you win these two and then say Monday was in Allen Fieldhouse, y- you have a situation where you might put yourself back into. Oh man, this is not a good feeling because. Uh, I just, you know, this team struggles on the road, clearly. And Allen Fieldhouse is not an easy place to play, despite the fact that everybody else that's gone in there this year has actually battled with them and and made it kind of interesting. So we'll just see. But you got to get it figured out. I I, I mean, we'll, we'll get predictions here for on, on the week. But I, I do think K-State can get it done. It's just it'll be interesting to see how they do it because – you're starting to real, you're starting to think you're going to get less from Tyler Perry than just hoping, hey, maybe he busts out this game. I'm starting to think we're just not going to get it. You have to cherish those three minute bursts where he he actually knocks down shots for you, and then hope that for the other 37 minutes somebody else does something good enough. Yeah, I, I'm, on the Oklahoma State topic, um, they still have not beat anybody in the top 125 of any metric this year, so that's. You know, to be the team that is the first to lose to them would not be a good feeling. Um, give them credit. They beat West Virginia. West Virginia had the, had the lead with less than two minutes left. And then Oklahoma State scored the final six points to win that game, which probably says as much about West Virginia as it does against Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State is a terrible defense, uh, the worst defense in the league, worst two-point defense in the league. Um, they're also not very good at forcing turnovers. Um, you're – they're, they haven't been very good at offensive rebounding. So you're getting probably two of your best matchups in the league this week with two teams that don't do the things well that you struggle with against you. So that magnifies it even more to me. Like these are teams you've got to, to, to beat. Uh, I don't care if it's at Oklahoma State. There will be, what, 5,000 people there maybe. Yeah, and it should, and 2,000 of them should be K-State fans at least. So hopefully – I, I, I imagine it will be pretty close to 50-50 again. I do think this is this is one of those weeks where you got to make a move, and it's, it's up to K-State to take advantage of it. And and, and I, I, I do think they will. I think this is going to be a good week, and we'll feel a lot better next Sunday when we talk. Drew, 2-0 week? Yeah, I'll say 2-0. and I – I'll go as far as to say I think K State wins the next three. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm not going to go that far, but 
It could I like, happen. I like that, Drew. I like it. I'm, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm back. <laughs> okay. I, I, I was feeling low after Houston, but then I watched everybody else in the league. I'm like, huh, nobody can really do anything on the road. So, yeah, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, real quick, personnel wise this week, there was a lot of talk yesterday uh, on the boards because Day Day Ames had what could easily be argued as his best game of the season. And a lot of guys did not have their great games uh, yesterday. Uh, how much more should Day Day Ames realistically play? And, and what could that do to actually help K State, namely a guy like Tyler Perry, that he has to score the basketball and knock down shots for you at some point if you actually want to win at the level that you do if you're K-State. Because, look, th this team going and doing what they've done, who knows how the season plays out. If they don't make the NCAA tournament, it won't be the most shocking thing. It, it shouldn't be looked at as a massive failure this year considering everything that's gone on. But in a year and a half, I, I feel like I have a good understanding of how Jerome Tang and his staff will work with things they would feel that way if this team doesn't get there because they do believe this team is good enough to make it happen. So what what needs to happen with the day-to-day -day aim situation and in turn Tyler Perry to make K-State a better basketball team moving forward? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, we've <laughs> I've kept bringing up these charts of what the lineups look like with aims on and aims off. And even when he hasn't played real well, Still, for the season, it's better than than when he's off the court. So even though his individual numbers have been awful, um, it was his best game against a top 100 team in Ken Palm by far. Um, he he was efficient. I think a lot, a lot of it came kind of in garbage time. So we have to acknowledge that. But I, I think the point of moving Perry off the ball for some stretches of the game not only helps him to get more shots, but I also think it helps him in fatigue because I think playing on the ball and trying to play defense that he has to play at this level and hunt shots um, has taken its toll on him. I mean, he's, he's had three games in single digits in a row. He's only done that one other time, and that was in his first 10 games at North Texas. So um, his worst stretch of basketball in his career uh, probably during this stretch and probably is definitely his worst two-game stretch. I do think he's good enough to come out of it and be better. I mean, he's still averaging 12 points a game and just big 12 play. So even with those three single digit games in a row, um, he's, he's, he can still be a solid player. Um, I do think it allows you um, the ability to play Kaluma at the four, Cam at the three and Gasson or Will McNair at the five, which I think is probably the better lineup. We've talked about that all year. Um, it's just been a matter of, can you find that third guard to put on the perimeter that allows you to move Columbia to the four and then rotate those other guys at the five? Um, I think defensively we're probably the best with David Gasson at the five as well. So um, I, I don't think there's any magic. I don't think anyone's going to step up and be in the top three players besides the guys we already have. So it's going to be Kaluma, Cam, and then Perry probably right now is the third option. Um but he's got to be the better third option, clearly, not the third option we've seen the last two games. And honestly, I, I think we also need more from David Gasson. Like, he's still defending mm -hmm. and rebounding, but he's not scoring much. He's – he's Well, and the rebounds have, have have dipped too. I think yeah. he's, well, he's only and, gone above – He's I mean, he hasn't gotten to seven since, I think, the second game of league play. So well, in, which, big, in Big 12 play – Gasson averages 6.3 points and 5.9 rebounds, and McDare averages 7.6 points and 6.6 .6 rebounds. So he's he's above him in both in Big 12 play only. Yeah. So and you can't have that, that is, no. Will McNair's not, not looked good out there. No, because he is, and he's not played. You know, he's not nearly the defenders Gasson is, and we've talked about that plenty this year. Mm -hmm. So that's got to be corrected. And I think Ames is an option at the two would would be a factor there. I'll also add in, like, it wasn't just the Houston game. I thought that uh, we kind of saw Day Day Ames turn a little bit of a corner against yeah. Iowa State, too. I mean, he only had five points, but he was two of three from the field. So we're seeing... Yeah, the, converted in and one. Yeah, he looked... He just looked a lot faster than a lot of the other guards that K-State has besides Cam Carter. And I, I think that, that that is definitely something. 
And I'm to the point where, like, if McNair or Gasson isn't playing well right away, I would instantly flip the switch and not go with Jarrell Colbert at the five and just put another guard in. I agree. Because the the offense flows so much better with another guard. Yeah. 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 And, and, I, and I'd, go ahead. Now, I'd also just add RJ Jones has gotten some different, decent minutes the last couple of games as well, two of the last three, especially. So that's nice to see um, him have an 11 minute game and a 12 minute game the last couple and hit a shot or two. And those two can only help you because, you know, I, I love the energy and the explosiveness of Dorian Finister, but he can't make a shot, you know? Yeah. And at least, at least Ames and Jones are scoring threats. And I think, you know, it's a wash with their offense compared to Dorian's defense. And, you know, you're going to need all three. You're going to rotate all three probably, and each is going to have a moment. Each is going to have a bad moment. But um, it's better to have three guys to choose from than just one. And I think it looks like you have three guys maybe that can give you 10 to 12 minutes a night on a certain night and play well. Well, I'm I'm with you, Drew. You just can't right now if – McNair's not working. The response cannot be to put Colbert in now. I know that we're all conditioned to think that it's like, okay, big for a big. Uh, McNair looks slow and is tanking you on defense. So put the really tall, long guy in on D. That might help. It worked for stretches against Baylor, but you have both guys are problems right now. McNair is slow and terrible on defense. He weighs you down there. And Colbert. He lacks hands. I don't think he owns a pair. And he also just isn't very smart at times. He gets lost offensively. He struggles to find his right spot. I think you have to go and just be smaller. And honestly, like you look at Oklahoma, they are a, a reasonable option to do that against. They're not just massive guys. I mean, they're going to they're gonna play a 6-7 guy at the 4 most of the time. So, you know, you might be a little bit undersized uh, occasionally, but they're not a great rebounding team, like Fan said. And to K-State's point on this, not like K-State's grabbing a ton of rebounds right now. So if you put a smaller guy in, it's not really changing the way you play. You're already not grabbing rebounds the first time you get the chance. So why does it matter? Uh, I would rather maximize what you could do offensively and see what comes from that because you have struggled so much and because unlocking Tyler Perry in some way offensively, if you can find the right solution, that's going to make your team significantly better than if you start grabbing more rebounds, I think. Um, because the first step is to actually doing something with those possessions you get and Tyler Perry making shots is better than a turnover or another miss from K-State. So we'll Five see how out. it works out. Five out is also not an offense that's built to have two bigs on the floor at once. And, and you're not playing to David Gasson's strength by having him play the four either. Yeah. So at, and, some, at some point, it just needs to be three guards well, out there. And, and two, I mean, two bigs that really can't shoot the ball in, in a lot of spots mm -hmm. on the floor. I know that we've seen Gasson. He made a three against Baylor. Two of them, one didn't count. Uh, but he's still reluctant to shoot it, and you still would rather that not be the shot he's taking. And then McNair, yeah, he made, the, what, the three against Providence to start the game, and then we haven't seen it uh, since then. Like, that, you just can't do that. And uh, that will be a good offseason conversation about, you know, the offensive philosophy right now because it does seem like the five out was really just done in an effort to push to get Patrick and Gongba, and they didn't land him. So, you know, now you're kind of stuck doing it because you spent all summer with these guys like this is the offense we're running and it doesn't really work for this team. Uh, maybe maybe it works better than than my perception of it does for them, but it does feel like they're they're running something that maybe doesn't align best with the personnel that they have, especially now that you consider that Naquan Tomlin's not there because it would have worked a little bit better if you had Naquan Tomlin who, you know, could have been a true four or – you know, you can play him at the five because of his size and length, and you just don't have that option anymore. So a lot of things worked against K-State uh, in terms of how this team is built offensively. Yeah, I was about to say, Nikon Tallon would have been a monster in five out because he would have been a matchup problem. So, like, yeah. th that part really hurts. So, you, But you just can't have this with two bigs on the floor. 
Yeah, it's not ideal. And and honestly, sometimes I don't even know how much they really run the five out as they were during a non-con. I, I, I think it looks like they run a lot more sets and actions than they used to uh, that are calls that aren't just uh, five out continuous motion with with options i think i think they've reduced the options and given given the players more sets that they're running so not necessarily working great but i think you have to um the the i mean the biggest thing is what you've we've talked about Kalum and cam have got to quit turning the ball over because yeah. those two are are really the biggest guys that have the struggle with it trying to make plays that aren't there and uh trying to force things i think Tank calls it trying to hit home runs and not settle for a single. And sometimes you got to settle for a single. Yeah. This, I mean, the, the, this K state roster needs to realize that they're built like the, the Royals right now. There aren't many guys <laughs> that can put it over the fence on a regular enough basis to make that your swing. Uh, yeah. You're going to have to try and get guys on and, and get them in. So we'll see uh, how it works out and where they go from here. All right. couple things before we get out of here. Let's focus on the remaining schedule for the Wildcats and what they need to do to get into the NCAA tournament because that is still what everybody wants out of this team and I think what is still capable of this team. Like I I'm not to the point yet where you know maybe I'll I'll joke and be overly pessimistic and and talk about how fun the NIT is going to be this this season. But in my head I don't actually believe that K-State is an NIT team right now. They have played like it. The resume might suggest they are, but I think that they can get over that hump. What needs to be done with the schedule that is remaining for them? And if you're watching on the YouTube, you can see it up there as well as the net ranking next to each opponent that they will face. So what needs to be done for this team to get to the right side of the bubble? Well, you've got plenty of chances in quad one games. You've got BYU twice. you got Iowa State. At home, you got KU twice. TCU has moved up to be a quad one game right now. And you've got two road games at Cincy and Texas. Um, the home games, you know, you got BYU, Iowa State, KU, TCU. You've almost certainly got to win three of those four, if not all four. Um, the sort of winnable road games you have left at Cincy, at Texas, um, probably split at least one of those, take advantage of one of those. And then you've got the road game at Oklahoma State this week. You, I, I think you absolutely have to win that one. You absolutely have to beat West Virginia at home. And then you have the Oklahoma game, which right now is a quad two game. you got to win that one. So, you know, those. I think those four road home games against BYU, Iowa State, KU, and TCU will be big. Um, you hope you'd, you'd like to win all four to reduce that margin for error, but that's not always going to be easy to do. You're, you're probably not going to go to Allen Fieldhouse and win. Who knows about going to BYU? That's a kind of a weird matchup game. Um, that would be nice to steal because it would be great for your metrics. Because I, even though BYU's five in the net, I don't think they're five in the net. Oh no, no, at all. But they've gamed it so well that they're staying there. I think Iowa State's kind of done the same thing. So <clears throat> that was a missed opportunity to win that net builder game that you lost. So. Um, and, and winning a road game against the top 20, top 30 net team is one of the biggest boosters for your net ranking. Plus, it's an automatic, almost guaranteed quad one win at the end of the season. So those are the ones I look at. Like I said all year, we have, we're, we have one quad one win. You got to get that to at least four, probably five, and then have no bad losses. And I think you're, I think you're in. And the, the path is there. Plenty of opportunities to do it. Now it's just about getting it done. I'll keep it a lot simpler. I'll say win all the home games, win two road games, and you're fine. Yeah, so, I mean, what that would that would end up putting K-State then final record in the Big 12. If you win all of your homes, that put you in. So are you – well, win two just in total and counting the one they already have against West Virginia? Yeah. I think okay. because I'd be eleven and seven in the Big Twelve, and no, no team, would oh, be, yeah. no team is getting yeah. locked out there. Now we're talking I, six, seven seed. But but so yeah. you, you but you still are you so you're still saying ten and eight is what you they need to get to, or you're just saying that for the simplicity of 
making sure, hey, this is this is the easiest way to look at it instead of trying to math, hey, you need this combination. Just win your home games and, and beat Oklahoma State. Yeah, I'd say yeah. because t- 10 and 8, you're not getting left out. I, I have a yeah. – I don't even think 9 and 9. No, I – gets yeah. left out. Well, if, West Virginia got in at 7 and 11 last year in the league. Now, yeah. they they had some better wins than what K-State has and projects to have right now. Um, but still, I the Big 12 is going to get enough love, and I, I think I wrote this last week or something. Uh, K-State will get enough love because they have the Big 12 logo on their chest. They'll also get enough because Jerome Tang is on their sideline. Like, yeah. that is the position that they're in right now. K-State is not some nobody right now. They are a somebody because of Jerome Tang. And the the NCAA selection committee is not going to sit there and be like, well, you know, we could put a fifth Mountain West team in because they went <laughs> 20 and seven against, you know, a bunch of scrubs. Or we could put, you know, 18 and 13 K-State with Jerome Tang in. Like, what are you going to do? Yeah. So I think K-State has a little bit of leeway there, but to feel good, and to get all the, uh, the the bracketologists out there on your side, I you, you've got to win these two games this week. I think you would hope to get a split against KU and BYU, uh, and then just kind of keep doing that along yeah. the way, and that puts you in a in a decent spot where you could probably count up there that you get to six, seven more wins, and if you do that, you get to ten. So I think win both this week and then just make the goal the rest of the way, get your splits, go one and one each and every week, because you're not going to, after what you just had this week, there isn't a week where K-State has back-to-back road games in the same week. There are only back-to-back roadies that are left. It's Cincinnati KU. They start different weeks. That's a Saturday to a, to a Tuesday turnaround. So the opportunity is there. Uh, The big 12 tournament will be, something that is there for them but we've seen in recent years those wins don't seem to mean as much anymore to make a difference i mean it feels like almost the last year that that made any difference i think k-state was the beneficiary of it in 2017 when they got that win against baylor and then they came very close and maybe should have beaten west virginia the very next night in the semifinals since then it seems like conference tournament performances have not been rewarded and that's even with teams that have made it to their conference title games uh, and played very well and beaten good teams along the way. So the Big 12 tournament, while it could be fun, uh, if you want it to help K-State, they just need to show up and win the whole thing. And that's going to be a tough grind for a team that isn't going to get the double bye. I'll also say like 9-9 and nine gets you in, but you're probably sweating a little bit. 10-8, and, yep. and eight, you're feeling really good. 11-7, yeah. and seven, and you're like, holy shit, we're like a six seed. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. It, I think nine wins or less for this K-State team. You might be thinking to yourself, what is Dayton like on Tuesday? You know, what what is yeah. that going yeah. on? Uh, which I did see Mike DeCourcy this week. He had K-State and Wake Forest uh, meeting up in Dayton, which <laughs> would just you know, get to relive 2017, a little rematch. So we'll have to see. Yeah. Danny Manning's not walking through that door, though. No, that's true. <laughs> I'm, I'd be a little bit more worried about Steve Forbes than I think I uh, was Danny Manning, who made a Bruce Weber <laughs> offense look like they knew how to play. Lit him up. Lit him up. <laughs> yeah. That, and then K-State lost to a current Big 12 team, Cincinnati. Right. Uh, which yep. in Sacramento, I don't have many thoughts or uh, remembrance of that game. So, all right. That is what is left for K-State. We'll keep an eye on it, obviously, as things move along. Final thing, college basketball outsider time, taking a look at the Big 12 and what went down this week. Here are the Big 12 standings. Would not have expected Texas Tech to be at the top uh, by themselves. Now, they and Baylor only played one game this week. This was their uh, week where they had a a bye in the midweek. For K-State, that will come uh, after the BYU game. So they'll play KU next Monday and then at BYU on Saturday. They'll have the whole week off, and then they play TCU, which is probably not a bad thing to get rested up before you get punched in the face and the body and wherever by Jamie Dixon's team, who uh, has been pretty physical in the past. So Tech at the top, Iowa State and Houston at 5-2, and two, and then three teams at 4-3 and three with K-State, KU, and TCU. Baylor sandwiched in the middle because they're scared and they didn't play anybody this week. And then Oklahoma, Cincinnati, UCF, BYU, Texas, all 3-4. and four. 
West Virginia should have been with the three and four group. They dropped to Oklahoma State, who finally got a Big 12 win. Uh, but both of those teams still below 500 on the season. So uh, what do we make of the Big 12, where it stands right now, and what we saw from the league this week? My my uh, call out is going to be Texas Tech basically is us last year. Um, they're winning right now with the number one offense in the Big 12 and the number 12 defense. I don't think that's sustainable. I don't think their offense is as good as it was. It's kind of like how we played against Texas and Baylor last year on the non early in the season, got those two road wins. So I think they're going to run into that stretch just like we did last year where they lose five out of six in the league or something like that and probably lose a game or two. They don't think they should because I don't think yeah, – I, I, it's weird that they're winning with McClaslin and not having a very good defense. And I, I don't think that's sustainable when you're that kind of style of a coach. I think you're kind of getting lucky because you're hitting threes right now, but sometimes that runs out. I think Houston's legit. They're top three in both offense and defense, the only team in the league that's top five in both offense and defense. So uh, that seems like a sustainable team. You know, the one to watch, Baylor's had heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak. They're five and six in offense and defense, which is the best other combo besides Houston, actually. Uh, but they're sitting at three and four. So who knows when you look at that. Other other teams that I think are kind of – could be a, a teeter. Iowa State's only ninth in offense and fifth in defense. Uh, I think their defense is probably better than it showed. The offense is probably a little bit better too, but you still wonder because they're not – they did hit shots against KU. That's why they won the game, but they're not a great shot-making team. And then TCU's kind of flipped. They're number four in offense and number 10 in defense. And usually those kind of disparities are going to catch up with you. And I think, you know, that's that's something to watch out for. That, I mean, to be fair, you got to watch out for, for us because we're 10 in offense and three in defense. So you don't like to see those splits where you're seven or eight spots differential between your offense and defense and league plays. But part of it's the uh, non, non-balanced non schedules, which plays into fact, which suddenly Bill Self's concerned about. <laughs> uh, when when you have non balanced schedules, it may cause you not to win the league. Really, Bill. So <laughs> thanks for thanks for pointing that out to us. We didn't know that going in. Yeah, let's. Uh, I I'll, maybe I'll do some research here and go see uh, what like the 07 KU schedule looked like. By, because... by the way, according by the way, Bill, according to Ken Palm, you've played the weakest schedule in the Big Twelve so far. So good luck. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, they. Uh... Not, I mean, KU, their, uh, their entire 07 season, they only played two ranked opponents in Big 12 game or three, uh, and all of them came from the South, <laughs> Oklahoma State, Texas A&M, yeah. and Texas. So uh, that, I mean, we, we talked about it a little bit this morning, but like you think back to that, like KU was the only team in the North that was good for yeah. a large stretch there where – you know, it wasn't until really like Beasley shows up and then yeah. K-State became better. Missouri around that time elevated yeah. themselves to being better. But like the Colorado was perpetually bad. Nebraska, Iowa State, same type of deal. Um, like some of those teams got a little scrappier, but if you were losing to them, like you felt bad about it. <laughs> and, you know, Frank Martin knows all about losing to like Nebraska or Colorado and games that you shouldn't. So, yeah, uh, the unbalanced schedule thing is a little different. I think what one thing that makes it tougher about this current setup is that there's no rhyme or reason to the unbalanced mm -hmm. schedule. Where at least you know early on there you could go, hey, we have a north and a south. That's just how this works. Now it's kind of like I do get. I could if Bill Self had brought this up. Now people would not have felt sorry for him. I don't necessarily necessarily feel <laughs> sorry for him. But I could have listened to an argument if he sat there and went, well, why is it that we play Houston twice and that we play Baylor twice <laughs> and that we play K-State twice this year? Like, why are those our double ups when you've got other schools that you look around and you say, oh, that, that's not as tough for them? Because uh, like Iowa State, for example, who, you know, he may have been throwing some shade at with how things have gone. Uh, now, I would say this, Iowa State has faced uh, in their first – uh, seven Big 12 games. Five of the seven have been ranked teams. Uh, K State and Oklahoma State were the only ones that weren't. But 
Iowa State only has to play Baylor once, only has to play Kansas once. Um, they do have to play Houston twice, so you know that's a something there. They only played Texas once, who at the start of the year was a team that you look around and said that's probably going to be at the top. Now things have changed, so um, I get where he's coming from for for this. He's just probably the wrong messenger to be getting it out there. <laughs> Uh, although the national college basketball world might listen a little bit more and not, you know, true. go into reasons about, well, if I don't know, 15 years ago, you seem to benefit pretty good from it. So, <laughs> yeah, my, my team call out, I think Houston, I think is far and away the best team in the league. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if they end up running away with the big 12. I, I just think the way that they play is a lot more sustainable than some other teams. Uh, the other thing that I'll just say about the this league is I don't remember a time where in any conference where 12 of the teams have three conference wins after seven games. And I think TCU and Texas Tech are the only teams that have multiple road wins, which is crazy to think about right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a good point <clears throat> there. Uh, add K-State to that list after this week. Uh, cause you know, no, don't tell anybody that it was against Oklahoma state and West Virginia, but, uh, put them on there. But you can't always waltz in the West Virginia and win the game. We've, true. we've seen that a couple times now. Yeah, K state has been about the only team that's been able to actually do that where they walk around and go, this is easy. So <laughs> we'll, we'll have to, uh, monitor that moving forward. Cause yeah, uh, West Virginia at home this year. They are uh, they're un they're unbeaten in Big Twelve play at home outside of their K State game. They're two and one. So I don't know. And both of those games, you know, they they beat good opponents. So that unbalanced uh, schedule though. That's the reason that K lost that game to West Virginia. Yeah, and UCF. They <laughs> it was already in their heads that they weren't going to see those teams again, and they just said, "This is unfair. How dare they?" <laughs> you know, that's why UCF has been competitive with everybody except K State. They said, "Well." why should we even play hard in this game? We don't get to see them in Orlando. So protest, you know, we're going <laughs> to play our worst. See how it goes from there. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see how the big chill shakes out. I am with you, Drew Houston, yeah. physically, the way they play all these things, they are the best team in the big 12. Um, but this is just like, you know, and I, I got proven wrong last year, but I was not going to jump off of Oklahoma until, you know, the Sooner Schooner absolutely crashed and the wheels had fallen off and you can't get them back on. I'm still taking Kansas to win the Big 12 this season until they have like seven losses. I'm going to, until they are mathematically eliminated, I still think KU is winning this league because I have a lot of historical data to back it up that they will get it done. Now, the scheduling has changed, so that uh, the the Mason both computer in here, it's got to readjust and recalibrate. But right, they, their start of February, like that'll be when I think that you could potentially eliminate them because that yeah, they yeah. Play, Saturday they play at home against Houston, then they go to K State, then they play home against Baylor. I mean that so those that's a pretty tough. Three games. Yeah. I don't want to look. I don't want to kick Scott Drew while he's down. He's already happening to. <laughs> come to the realization that Jerome Tang is the sole reason why he was a good coach at Baylor and had all this success. Um, I, I don't think they're, they're very good this year. Um, at least in terms of what people expected. Uh, I mean, that's one of those that if you want to complain about schedules and stuff, and then we're saying, well, Bill, just win these games that you're supposed to. Hey, you cannot lose at home to Baylor this year. Like, yes, there is talent on this Baylor roster, but I just, I don't think very highly of them. Uh, and if Baylor was better, they would they wouldn't be three and three right now in the Big Twelve. They would have taken care of business along the way. Uh, they have lost two games in overtime. Yeah, but I mean, look, even yesterday, how how can you lose a home game where you get a second overtime to try and right your wrong, and then you get a third one and you still can't overcome it? Like, come on, you you have to find a way to win that game if you're legit. So I'm. I'm out on Baylor and Scott Drew this season, and I was never really in on them. Uh, so it's nice that K State got them before uh, they really got exposed as frauds, and they still were a top ten win. But I'm out on Baylor, and I, I think that they they're going to be uh, in for a, a tough season down there. And I'm just asking Jerome if he'll come back and take a you know 
a pay decrease and uh, a, a change in his title because they they seem to desperately need him. So, all right. Well, that will do it for us. We will have all the coverage you need next week for K-State basketball as they try and get some impactful wins against Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. And then we will be back next Sunday, recap the week that was, get ready for the KU game on Monday night in Bramlage, and everything in between, lots of stuff going on over at K-State Online. So head to On3, get signed up if you're not, and uh, be sure to be subscribed to the website there and also here to the YouTube and podcast platform. So for Drew Galloway, KSU underscore fan, I am Mason Voth. We are out of here. Um, to the Chiefs fans, good luck. I hope they win today uh, because there's nothing that I, as not a Chiefs fan, dislike more than anything is people trying to discredit the greatness of Patrick Mahomes. So – I, I desperately want this for him. Uh, really nobody else affiliated with him, though, because he does have a pretty dislikable family. So uh, if he does lose, I'm okay with the sadness and pain that is his wife, his mom, his brother, that they will all feel. Uh, his dad's never done anything wrong, uh, at, at least that I know of uh, publicly, for me to go, oh, this guy. So there you have it. But And uh, all the Taylor Swift shots on TV, so – all the, the old men out there get grumpy about her being shown. So I want Mahomes to be great, and I want Taylor Swift shots on TV. Those are my two asks for the AFC championship today. That's, so, I'm going to call uh, nine. Nine Taylor Swift shots today. And I want, I want just as many Taylor Swift shots as I get Brock Purdy interceptions in the second game. So <laughs> load me up with Taylor Swift and Brock Purdy. That's what I want uh, on, on this championship Sunday. Fan and I are the Swift are the Swifties among the three of us. So yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's get on the record real quick then. Uh, who who's the Super Bowl matchup after tonight? KC Detroit. That that that's what I'm. That's hoping what I want to say. Uh, <laughs> I just you know I, I think it'll be I I take I took Kansas City and Detroit as well. Uh, I'll go Kansas City and San Francisco. It would be fun to watch Patrick Mahomes just run circles around Brock Purdy. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. Got to reunite with uh, old friend Alec uh, on, on Wednesday. And uh, his intern that works for him up there grew up an Iowa State guy. And so we, uh, we had a lot of conversation up there about Brock Purdy. He obviously thinks Brock Purdy is the chosen one, is this great you know gift to the world and all this other stuff. And uh, I just was trying to demean him the, the entire time we talked about Brock Purdy. He also brought up 2020 for Iowa State football. I was like, oh, boy, let me fill you in on all of this. So uh, yeah. I wish nothing but the worst for Brock Purdy today. So, we're out of here. We're back next week.